we are going to talk today about the world's largest industry. The energy industry is a six trillion dollar industry and it is being transformed right now. It is being disrupted right now. And this is vital because energy is a moral issue. Today we're in the 21st century and still 1.3 billion people on earth don't have access to modern energy, to electricity. Now you see where those are spread around the world, in South Asia and Africa primarily. And South Africa has done an amazing job addressing this. In 1980, only one third of South Africans had electricity. Today it's 90%. But you see that this needs to continue and go further because energy is not just about individual lives, it's about development. If you look at this map of the world, the places that have robust economies are the places that are lit up, that are electrified. If we look at the economy of countries around the world, their GDP per person versus their amount of energy, there's an inextricable link. If you want more growth, if you want a rich economy that makes people have better lives, you need to have access to modern energy. But there's a second moral component to this because the way that we produce energy today is deadly. The World Health Organization estimates that five and a half million people are killed by air pollution as a result of energy, of combustion of fossil fuels every year. Here in South Africa, somewhere between 20,000 people and 50,000 people a year die from air pollution. At 20,000, that's more than the number of South Africans that die in traffic accidents. It's more than the number of South Africans that die of murder. At 50,000, it's more than those two combined. It's one out of every 13 deaths in South Africa is caused by air pollution. And this, fortunately, this old way of producing energy with fossil fuels is being disrupted right now. Here's an example of that. This is Peabody Coal. This was the largest coal mining company in the United States. It was the largest privately held coal company in the world. And over a period of three years, Peabody Coal went bankrupt. And not only Peabody Coal, Arch Natural Resources, Pioneer Coal, the four largest coal companies in the United States, all went bankrupt because they were disrupted by innovation and energy. In this case, by an influx of cheap natural gas. But that disruption now has shifted to clean energy, which is disrupting fossil fuels around the world. Let's start with wind power. Yesterday, Adriana told you that while the planet is finite, we have an open system. We're constantly receiving energy from the sun. And some of that heats up the atmosphere and drives winds around the world. Wind power was a footnote in the global energy mix just a decade ago. But in the last 10 years, it's grown by 700% in one decade, an incredible surge, and now it's five, six percent of electricity around the world. That happened in part because of government policy, but also because this is an exponential technology that has seen an incredible plunge in prices. The wholesale price of electricity in the US is around five or six cents a kilowatt hour, US cents. We'll come back to that number again and again. And in 1980, Wind power cost 10 times that. There was no economic incentive to deploy it. But over the decades since then, the price of wind power has plunged by an incredible 30 times. And even if we back away all subsidies, we have a 15 times reduction in cost. And now in windy places like the US interior, Wind energy is just the cheapest power you can buy, and it's disrupting coal and gas there. We're building these larger and larger wind turbines that can harness faster winds and can turn more of that wind into energy. And not only are they driving down the cost, they're increasing the steadiness. We always wonder about what happens if the wind doesn't blow. But the fraction of time that new wind turbines capture energy is rising and rising and rising at the same time. Now we can look at 
how wind power is distributed around the world or how wind speeds are. And there are hot spots around the world. I just used prices from the US interior, you can see in the upper left. But South Africa also is incredibly blessed with wind resources. You have incredible resources inland, also at the Cape, at Port Elizabeth. These are world-class wind resources. And that, as a result, means that wind power in South Africa is also plunging in price. In the last six years, the price of wind power in South Africa has dropped by about two-thirds. Well, what, is, what do these numbers mean? Let's compare it to the price of building a new coal power plant. Wind power is already cheaper than coal in South Africa and is just going to keep getting cheaper and cheaper. Now, that's power on land, but there's even better resources offshore. The best winds in the world aren't on land. If you look at wind speeds around the world, it's all on the coast, just off the coast. And if we zoom in again on the southern area of Africa, this area around the Cape and the entire coast of South Africa, these are class seven winds. These are the best winds in the entire world, an incredible natural resource. Now, wind offshore has been incredibly expensive, many times more expensive than onshore wind, because these things, you have to mount them to the seabed, they're expensive to maintain, and so on. But that has changed just in the last year or so. In the last four years, the price of offshore wind power has dropped in half, and now we had a milestone just in May or June of this year. We had this wind farm bid, win an auction in the North Sea, in the Netherlands, actually owned, but built by a, a company from Denmark, Dong Energy. And this came in with zero subsidies, just matching or beating wholesale coal prices and nuclear prices in North Europe. And the wind speeds in South Africa are every bit as good. And the price of these turbines will keep coming down and down and down. Now, I could go on about wind, but I want to talk about solar power because solar power's pace of innovation makes wind power look slow and stagnant. In the last 40 years, the price of solar power has plunged. In 1977, to buy one watt of solar panel cost about $77. Now it costs 30 cents. The 250 times reduction in price. It's hard to overstate how massive this is. This hasn't happened in the price of tractors or of building roads or of building buildings or of building factories. There's almost no comparison to this except the digital revolution or perhaps the biotech revolution that Raymond talked about. This is an incredible disruption happening, using technology to harvest energy directly from the photons hitting us. And that means that we're now seeing crossover. By crossover, I mean the point in time where without any subsidies in the sunniest parts of the world, solar is just the cheapest energy you can buy, period. Let me show you. In the US, a new natural gas plant costs five or six cents a kilowatt hour. That's about what a new coal plant costs in South Africa. In the west of China, a massive solar plant is being built at about six cents a kilowatt hour. In the US, two years ago, the cheapest solar deal was in the Southwest at about six cents a kilowatt hour. I've had to update this slide about six times in those two years as new records have been set. And earlier this year, the city of Tucson in Arizona signed a deal at less than three cents. Even if we back away every subsidy, that's 4.3 cents, so cheaper than the cheapest gas or coal you can buy anywhere in the world. And South Africa is sunnier than Tucson, Arizona. In fact, the price of solar in the US has gone down by 5x. These are of 20-year-long contracts 
for electricity in the last eight years. India, 3.8 cent solar. And again, coal there is about 5 cents, so 20%, 25% cheaper than coal. And South Africa is sunnier than India. The price of solar contracts in India plunged by a factor of four in just four years. Mexico, three and a half cents solar by a Spanish company, NL. Chile, 2.9 cent solar. No subsidies, half the price of coal or gas. And then my favorite of these, my favorite picture, really, these guys in Dubai, not where you'd imagine solar to be blossoming in one of the coal or one of the oil capitals of the world. But last September, a record-breaking deal, 2.4 cents a kilowatt hour, less than half the price of coal or natural gas. This was not just the cheapest price for solar ever on planet Earth. This is the cheapest price for electricity of any form ever using any technology on planet Earth. This is the disruption that's happening. And it wasn't just one bidder. There were four companies that bid less than three cents. So this transformation is coming. I told you that wind power grew by about 7x in the last decade. Solar power around the world has grown by 50x in the last 10 years. You learned yesterday that if you take a hockey stick, exponential growth, you put it on a log scale, it should look like a straight line. Well, here's how solar looks. This is an exponential growth, growing at 35 or 40% per year. It will slow eventually. This kind of growth rate can't be physically maintained, but there's not really any sign of that yet. And this growth itself drives the prices down. If we look at the price of solar, or really of any exponential technology, as a function of scale instead of time, we see a straight line. This is what we call Swanson's Law. On the horizontal axis, it's how much solar has the world ever made. On the vertical axis, it's what's the price. They're both on log scales, and it's a straight line. It's the same thing in airplanes, in uh, Model T automobiles, with different slopes. But what this means is that as you scale, the price comes down. And so there's this virtuous cycle for every new technology. This is not limited to just solar. It's biotech, it's AI, it's robotics, which is at first your technology is expensive. You can only use solar panels on satellites. You can only use carbon fiber in the space shuttle. You can only sequence one genome for $3 billion. But then the price falls. And that allows you to tap into new markets. And when you tap into those new markets, because now your technology is cheap enough for them, then the demand goes up. And when the demand goes up, you can reinvest in R&D, the industry scales, and the price falls again. And you ratchet into larger and larger markets that require a lower price. And that's what's happening with solar. And it's now probably unstoppable. The question is not, will this transition happen with both solar and wind? It's just, how fast will it happen? Of course, this is regional. In the US, the examples I used were in the Southwest. In Europe, the solar revolution actually started in Germany. Are there any Germans in the audience? Anyone of German descent? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Germany is the last place I would build solar, because it's about as sunny as Alaska. But the German people decided they were going to do this. And they started that virtuous cycle. They scaled the industry, bringing prices down. And so we owe them a, a huge uh, thanks, actually, because that has made this technology cheaper for all of us. But if we come closer to home, of those 1.3 billion people that don't have electricity, 600 million of them live on this continent. And this is the sunniest continent on planet Earth. And that means it will eventually have the cheapest cost of energy. And that's a dramatic economic 
opportunity. And if we bring it even closer to home, South Africa, incredible solar resources, especially in the South and West. Now let's do a little bit of a comparison. Let's look at Germany. Germany has about 45,000 megawatts of solar, which is enough to power all of South Africa with just solar, and it's not a sunny place. In fact, if we uh, compare side by side, here's South Africa, and here's Germany to scale. So this one little corner of South Africa gets more sunlight than the entire nation of Germany. And about 1% of that rectangle would produce enough electricity for the entire country. And if we look globally, look at South Africa, South Africa is sunnier than India. It's sunnier than the U.S. Southwest. It's sunnier than China. It's as sunny as Chile. It's as sunny as Dubai. South Africa has every reason to expect that it can be a solar superpower with energy costs at that two and a half cent level, disrupting other technologies and making it feasible to manufacture goods here cheaply, to do other things with energy, to run data centers, other things that are electricity consumers that produce economic value. And if we compare the cost drop of many countries around the world, you see India, Peru, the US were always cheap, but here South Africa's cost of solar just plunging over the last few years, putting it into a world class. So now we see globally this incredible plunge in the price, especially of solar, but also wind, is disrupting things massively. In January, China canceled 104 planned coal power plants that would have been $80 billion of investment. 40 of those plants, the ones in red, had already broken ground. At least $20 billion was just thrown away. Just last month, in one month, India canceled 14 gigawatts of planned coal capacity, and the rationale was that the price of solar is literally in free fall. And so the world's coal pipeline is just drying up. We have almost reached the point where the world will just not build any new coal power plants, and where solar and wind, building new solar or wind, will be cheaper than even continuing to operate a quarter, perhaps, of the existing coal fleet that we have. This is disruption happening right now. Now, I know that in South Africa, there is some controversy about a nuclear plan, a plan to build up to eight nuclear power plants. And let me just say unequivocally, I am a fan of nuclear power. It's controversial, but nuclear power does not emit carbon. It's clean, it's safe, it's 24-7. And if I were in Northern Europe, say, or in Japan, I would think of this as a real option. But nuclear has real issues. And if we look at this plan to build nuclear power in South Africa at 600 billion rand, you can be sure that is not the price it would come in at. It would come in at much, much more than this. And in fact, nuclear reactors around the world are dropping in popularity. That top line, the thin orange line, shows the fraction of the world's electricity that comes from nuclear. It's gone from 17% to about 10%. And it's happened because new nuclear plants go over budget, they go over time, and a large chunk of them, perhaps a quarter, never actually get finished because they run out of money. This was supposed to be an $11 billion project to build two reactors in the US, and after spending $27 billion and not being done, it was ultimately scrapped, all right? The cost of nuclear has gone up over time instead of going down. The average price overrun of a new nuclear reactor is about 118%. The average cost overrun of wind is less than 10, solar about one. That's what we're looking at. So while nuclear makes good sense in many places, this is not the place with your ample provisioning of both sun and wind. Thank you. Now, people do ask, what do we do when the sun goes down? What do we do if the wind 
isn't blowing. Well, with the offshore wind you have here, wind can actually be quite steady. But we have options. One of them is just to note that wind plus solar together are incredibly complementary. This is from Southern California. The wind uh, blows mostly at night, the edges of this, and the sun shines during the middle of the day. So over a 24-hour period, they tend to balance. Or you look at Germany over 11 months, the sun shines more in the summer and the wind blows more in the winter. So putting them together, you can satisfy an awful lot of grid demand. But eventually, we have to get to energy storage as well. And this is now the most exciting thing happening in clean energy, in my mind. You all know who this person is? Tony Stark? <laughs> Some of you have heard that before. Tony here, I mean, Elon is introducing the Tesla Powerwall battery. It's actually full of Panasonic manufactured cells. And it's not that they had one single technological breakthrough. It's that we've had 15, 20, 30 years of continual exponential improvement in lithium ion batteries. In the last uh, seven years, since 2010, the price of lithium ion batteries has dropped by four or five X. That's what's making this possible. And in fact, if we look at that cost as a function of scale, solar is the top line here, the green triangles, and batteries are the blue diamonds. Batteries drop at the same pace as solar. So batteries are expensive today. They're still extremely expensive, still perhaps five to ten times too expensive to use for large bulk storage, but they're plunging in price in the same way that solar has over the last two decades. And behind current batteries, we have a whole slew of new technologies coming after lithium ion. Uh, this fellow, John Goodenough, he invented the lithium ion battery. In his laboratory, he has solid state batteries that can hold three times as much power per weight. Or we have lithium air batteries in the lab that could hold 10 times as much energy. So the drones outside could fly all day long instead of flying for 24 minutes at a time. Or we have grid scale batteries that are big and heavy. You don't care if it's stationary, but last for 10 times as many cycles. They can use for 30 years, bringing down the overall cost. So innovation in the sector will continue and continue and continue. Now, I want to come back to this point about cost. It all comes down to cost. People will buy the cheapest energy. And we used to always assume that clean energy meant expensive energy. We should do it to clean up the environment. We should do it for our kids and so on. But if you look at the logic, look at the numbers, the cost of energy fluctuates over time, but the cost of technology does what? It just goes down. And so we're looking at the very real likelihood that clean energy will just be the cheapest energy period. And now even very conservative organizations are saying this. This is the International Energy Agency, the IEA. This is not what you would call an exponential organization. I'll show you why. So let's look at the IEA's forecasts for how fast solar would grow around the world. Read from the bottom. In 2002, they forecast the light blue line in the bottom. Solar's gonna grow a lot, they said. In 2004, they came back and said, well, it's gonna grow a little faster than we thought. In 2006, they said, okay, well, still a bit wrong, we're gonna adjust it. 2008, 2009, every single year, the IEA has lifted their solar forecast. It's like some analyst is going to his Excel spreadsheet and hitting Control C, Control V, right? Something like that. Now, who thinks that that last forecast, 2014, that they've got it right? They figured it out. The IEA has finally figured out solar is growing exponentially. Who believes that? And these are the world's experts on energy. Okay, we've got two people believe that the IEA has figured it out. You're quite optimistic because they're nowhere close. They still forecast linear growth. They say the world is going to install the same amount of solar every year henceforth as it did in 2014. 
when the actual number is going up 35 or 40 percent. But even these guys say solar will be the dominant form of energy by mid-century and the price will be unbeatable. Or uh, these fellows, Alliance Bernstein is a private equity firm in the US. They put out this report that had this graph that said, welcome to the Terror Dome. It's from a public enemy song, if you know that. Across the bottom, you have the cost of coal, gas, and oil. And this is a 60-year time period. And then across the right, it looks like somebody's kid took a crayon and scrawled across their graph, right? Is that what that is? That's the cost of solar coming down over the long term. And if we layer in wind and layer in battery energy storage, you see this is a massive disruption that's happening. This is almost like a Kodak moment. Right? Now, energy is different than digital, and so this disruption will take decades. Let me not exaggerate how fast or easy it will be. This is going to take 20, 30, 40 years, but the disruption is inevitable. Now, all of that has been about electricity, but there is this other form of energy that we use, which is oil that we use for transportation. But that, too, is being disrupted. Sheikh Yamani, who was the Saudi oil minister during the crisis of the 70s, he says, the Stone Age didn't end for a lack of stone. Right? The Stone Age ended because we invented bronze tools. We left lots of stones lying on the ground. And what he's warning his fellow princes is that we're going to leave oil buried in the ground because we will have invented better technology. And that's happening now. Really three interconnected technologies. Electrification of transportation, self-driving, which Carlo's going to talk more about next, and rides as a service. These three all connect together. Because when you ride as a service, when you call a ride with Uber, you're paying per kilometer not up front, and per kilometer, the cost of electric vehicles is already equal to and soon much cheaper than internal combustion vehicles. And if you have self-driving, then rides as a service become cheaper because you're no longer paying the driver, and so we'll shift more and more to that model. And in both cases, when you get into a taxi or an Uber, do you ever wonder how much gas is in the tank? You don't. And so range anxiety about charging goes away. So these three trends will amplify each other. And even now, before that has kicked in, we see that electric vehicles are growing exponentially. There are only 0.2% of cars on the road, but there are now 1% of cars being sold. And they're growing at an incredible 70% per year. And that exponential growth rate is what dominates in the long run. And now we're hitting this mass market point. The Tesla Roadster was a $250,000 car. The Tesla Model S was an $80,000 car. And the Tesla Model 3 is a $35,000 car. That's the transformation of eight years. And we have not just Tesla, but half a dozen manufacturers working on vehicles at $30,000, $25,000, $20,000 with a 200 mile or greater range. And that makes it mass market. And here again, the forecasters have just completely missed the boat. In the US, the EIA did a forecast a year ago. How many electric cars would there be in the US with a 200 mile or greater range? It's the red line at the bottom. Can you even see it? It's 20,000 cars total by 2040. Tesla has taken pre-orders for half a million Model 3s. So bet on the innovators and not the forecasters. And here again, we get this virtuous cycle because the most expensive part of an electric car is the battery. And as you sell more batteries, their cost does what? It drops. And as their cost drops, the cost of the car drops. As the cost of the car drops, you sell more cars. As that happens, you're selling more batteries. And this virtuous cycle kicks in. And eventually, these cars will be the cheapest cars. Because this 
is the entire engine and drivetrain of an electric vehicle. It has 90% fewer moving parts than an internal combustion vehicle. They're expensive now because they're boutique objects, but when they're made at similar scale, they will just be cheaper. By 2030, a car like the Model 3 with self-driving features that accelerates like a Porsche could be cheaper than a two-seater smart car. That's what we're looking at. And if that happens, we're talking about major disruption. Countries see it. Beijing is switching all 70,000 of its taxis to electric. India has gone further. India's energy minister said last month that by 2030, there will be no gasoline cars sold in that country, only electric. That's how fast the trends are anyway. And if you play that forward, then you start to talk about not peak oil, but peak oil demand, the point at which we've switched our transportation to electricity and we're using less and less oil. Bloomberg thinks that could happen as soon as 2020. They're probably too optimistic. So what do big energy companies say? Shell says it could happen by 2030. French supergiant Total says 2025 to 2030. That's when the global demand for oil will peak and start to drop. And at that point, the price of oil will be permanently low. And that has massive geopolitical ramifications for countries that depend on oil for their income. Obvious countries like Saudi Arabia, less obvious countries like Russia that get 70% of their external revenue from oil and gas. I want to close by saying some things about how you can take action in this sort of a situation. We are in a crisis of multiple sorts. And the Chinese pictogram for crisis is both danger and opportunity. And I believe we have both. I've barely even mentioned climate change, the fact that the planet is heating up, and the massive challenges it poses for every nation around the world, including South Africa. And there's another challenge, because if we want to keep the planet under two degrees Celsius of warming, it turns out we have to keep three quarters of the oil and gas and coal that we know of today in the ground. Well, that is on the balance sheets of private corporations and sovereign nations. Some people say that's a $22 trillion of assets that have to be written off. Citi recently did the math, and they said it's $100 trillion of assets that have to be written off. That might be a massive economic bubble. But it's also creative destruction. I'm also an investor in clean energy and early stage startups, and I come at this looking for the gap the gap between what people need and what they're able to achieve or acquire today. And that gap is often satisfied by new businesses finding a combination of things. So this is solar in the US, rooftop solar. And rooftop solar in the US flourished because of three separate areas of innovation. One was technology, we talk about that all the time, but the other two were policy, and business models, and those were just as important. Technology plunged in price of solar, right? Partially had the German policy, but there were also policy changes. In the US, as in many places, you can take excess solar that your house generates and sell it back to the grid. In most of South Africa, you can't. So policy innovation is needed. But it was also business models. This, these are employees of SolarCity, a company run by Elon Musk's cousin and chaired by Elon. And SolarCity started with a conversation that Elon and Lyndon had where they said, we want to do solar, but we don't want to be a panel manufacturer. What's the unmet need? I said, oh, people can buy solar, but it might take them seven years to pay it back. That's not so bad, but it might cost them 10,000, 15,000 US dollars up front. Nobody has that. Said, oh, we'll finance it. We'll lease it to people, we'll own it, and we'll give them some of the savings, and we'll skim the rest. And that built a $4 billion market cap company that later got folded into Tesla, his $40 
billion dollar market cap company. It was a business model innovation that brought this all together. And these three areas of innovation, technology, policy, and business model, they feed on each other. And often what it takes is someone to show leadership to say, I can start this virtuous cycle spinning. And often those innovators reap tremendous, multi-billion dollar, in this case, opportunities. So I believe the future is bright on planet Earth, and in particular, for South Africa. Thank you very much. Fascinating, as always. All right. Thank you, thank uh -huh. you. So we've got some questions, actually, that have come in. All right. We want renewable, uh, re renewable sources of energy because oil and coal will soon be over. Aren't we just shifting the problem with mineral mining for batteries instead of coal mining for electricity? It's a great question. So are we just creating a new problem? There is nothing we've ever done that has zero environmental impact, but we are shrinking that impact tremendously. And we look at things like lithium, it's an opportunity now. So I see startups working on how do we recycle batteries, lithium batteries better, how do we recycle old solar panels. That's the way that I look at it. We got another one here in the front row. Thank you very much. You touched, especially when you spoke about oil, but you didn't touch on biofuels. You yes. only referred to alternatives like electric vehicles. <laughs> Etc. What about biofuels and, and, and its impact on food security? Yes. So most biofuels today, I think, are negative for food security and negative for the environment, to be totally honest. Palm oil, corn ethanol. I think there is hope for third generation biofuels, genetically modified algaes and so on, but it's getting harder because batteries are plunging in price so fast that for passenger cars, it's hard to see how biofuels get into that market today. But there are things like aviation that we don't see really a path to batteries, so there is still a need for it there. But it can't be the current biofuels that consume lots of water and compete with food crops for land today. Over here, gentlemen in the third row, middle. Given that the price of technology drops so precip precipitously, when is the right time for somebody to invest? If you invest today in wind and tomorrow it costs half as much, aren't you going to be disintermediated? That's an awesome question. So the way that that's hedged is that when you invest in a wind farm or a solar farm, you sign a long-term power purchase agreement, 20-year, 30-year deal that locks in a price. Otherwise, you're right, the deflationary nature would mean that your current investment would get undercut. But that's the way that you build in that security. So as a government, you invest when you need new energy, which South Africa does, and when you need to clean up your act so your citizens have better lives. And the sooner you do, there's also a, a local drop in price that comes from experience, expertise, building capacity. So to get the price lower in South Africa, you've got to build some projects in South Africa as well. 